I will um, talk about collaborations with uh, Tom Curtaid, Amir Ingeber, and Idoya Ochoa, which were largely inspired by some discussions with Golan Yona. And this is all they, uh, largely supported by the, by the Center for the Science of Information. So what we looked at was this problem of search in large database. So if you have some piece of data or string or sequence Y, and you want to know whether it appears somewhere in this really big database. You, you search it, whether it appears exactly or approximately according to some notion of similarity. Um, that's the basic search problem. As you can imagine, it appears in essentially any problem involving large databases. But what we wanted to do is understand how you can compress this big database down to a much more modest one that will comprise of signatures that you will extract from the large database. And these signatures you're going to use to, for doing the, the search, the similarity search. So the idea would be that you're going to take this, uh, this data, this query sequence Y, and only on the basis of these signatures you're going to get indications, if you will, candidates for similarity. And, um, and so then only those candidates, only those signatures that gave you sequences that are candidates for similarity, you will make the effort of going to the original big database and retrieving them and looking at them closely to see whether they are indeed as similar and interesting as you were hoping. Okay, so this sort of generic structure is re very relevant for many big database architectures and this is exactly the architecture in this sort of new generation of the Biozone platform which Golan Yona is currently developing at, at Stanford and, and the idea is that there's this really big database or large collection of data out there on the internet of a lot of biological data and what you're going to do is sort of crawl that data and extract small signatures that will overall form, that you will store on your sort of local warehouse. And from those signatures, you'll be able to do all sorts of inferences. And then, if needed, every once in a while, go back to the original databases and retrieve and look closely at the big data. So zooming in, the problem now is, is this. For, for, for this one data sequence, xn, so x superscript n is, is an n-tuple, x1 up to xn. You're going to have this encoder t, so encoder or hash function or uh, whatever the community you come from, but that's going to be the, the thing that extracts the signature from the data. You're going to get a signature of nr bits, so rate r, r bits per source symbol. And on the basis of that signature, your decoder is going to try to answer, so the decoder is going to see why, the query sequence. And on the basis of this signature, it's going to want to answer the question of, are these sequences similar? Okay, so is the distortion or the similar, so D, small d is some similar, the distortion criterion that we're using to measure similarity. And what you'd be trying to answer is whether the sequences are similar in the sense that the distortion between them is less or equal to some similarity threshold, capital D. Okay? So that's the problem, and we can try to think what would make a scheme good for this problem. So obviously what you want is a small probability of error, uh, but the thing is that not all errors are created equal. So Error here consists of two types of errors, either a misdetection or a false alarm. Now, a false alarm, if you think about what it represents, it would mean a signature that would, result, that would sort of flag a sequence as a suspect for similarity, where in fact, when you then retrieved it from the database, you found that it's not as similar or, or interesting uh, 
as you were hoping it would be. And on the other hand, a misdetection would correspond to a sequence that was not flagged and therefore not retrieved. And so it's an error that you're never going to get a chance to correct. So at least for the sort of biological database that, that um, motivated our, our work, this kind of an error was intolerable. Uh, especially given that, if you recall, we're zooming in here. We're looking at a problem of extracting one signature from one sequence. So if you allow even a small probability of misdetection for that problem, when you consider the fact that the database is going to have a ginormous number of such sequences, even a small probability of misdetection would translate to a probability of essentially one that you will be misdetecting some sequence or some sequences in the database. And this was intolerable um, for the applications that we had in mind. And so um, the requirement for us is going to be uh, no misdetection. And subject to that, what we want is a good system. So what would be a good system? One that has a small probability of false alarm. Because a small probability of false alarm just means a slight increase in you know, the fraction of sequences that you're going to have to retrieve from the database anyhow, because some are similar. You're going to have to retrieve them anyhow. A small probability of false alarm means a modest additional burden of retrieving some sequences in vain. Okay, so, uh, so the slogan is that the schemes we'll be looking at are ones where no means no, and yes means hopefully, usually with high probability, indeed yes, but, but sometimes no. So yes really means maybe. And so to reflect that, I'll uh, change the labels. Okay, so the output of, uh, of the decoder is either no or maybe. And um, slightly more mathematically, what does this no means no mean? So that's what we'll refer to as deadmissibility. Okay? So if you think about it, what you need is that if your decoder observes the signature, T, if there's any sequence that could have been mapped to this signature, which is within distortion D of the query sequence, okay? or in other words, if the inverse image of the signature intersects the D ball, the D similarity ball around the query sequence, then I need to say maybe. Okay? Otherwise, if there's no intersection, then, and only then, I can afford to say no. Okay? So these are the admissible schemes that we can work with. And, um, and another point, and in a sense, nice thing about this requirement is that it's purely combinatorical. Okay? It's not about any, doesn't relate to any probabilistic model that I'm putting on the data. It's not a high probability requirement. It's strictly combinatorical, and this is good, we found, again, when working with some practitioners, in that um, if you really wanted to get them to employ this thing, and if they really care about no misdetections, then you need schemes that or if you want your theory to guide the construction of schemes, then these schemes need to be sort of robust to your modeling assumptions, uh, which are often inaccurate at best. So with that, okay, and one more observation is that, you know, first homework exercise in your first course in probability, probability of a maybe is really, so probability maybe and probability of fa false alarm really determine each other. And because we're going to be the interesting regime, uh, and I'll be specific in, in a few slides, but the interesting regime here is one where the event of dissimilarity is the typical one. So most sequences in the database are not similar. There are only a few that you're looking for that are. So, so the event of dissimilarity is the typical one, and so not only do these probabilities determine each other, but if you want to get small probability of false alarm, that's actually equivalent to requiring small probability of a maybe. Okay? So really what we want is subject to deadmissibility schemes that have small probability of maybe. And the question now is how large does the, does the signature need to be? How large does the rate need to be? How many bits per source symbol do we need in order to allow for that? Okay? To allow you know, vanishing probability of maybes, which you can think of as you know, effective or reliable querying. So in the spirit of Shannon, 
to be more concrete, we're going to say that a rate R is achievable if you can find me schemes, okay, de-admissible schemes of rate R with vanishing probability of maybe. Vanishing as the size of the data increases. And our object of interest is the rate distortion function for queries, if you will, of the other RQ of D. So RQ of D is essentially the minimum rate that you need for the signature to allow, if you will, reliable or efficient querying uh, for similarity level D. Okay. So if you, and what we want is, you know, the first thing we would want is to try to characterize this thing. Um, and one very natural scheme that you might think of employing for this problem is, is the following. Just use your limited rate to give, to describe a lossy version of the source sequence. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna use a lossy compressor for the source sequence and describe to the decoder this lossy version x hat. Okay? Now the decoder is going to know that the source sequence is within distortion, thank you, is within distortion d prime of um, of the reconstruction that it sees, right? Where d prime, if you will, is the distortion rate function of the source x evaluated at the rate r of the signature. Uh, or in other words, d prime is just the distortion that this lossy compressor achieves. And then it's going to ask itself, so, so this, if you will, this, this ball is playing the role of the inverse mapping of the signature. And now it's going to ask itself, okay, is this ball intersecting? the D similarity ball around the query sequence or not. If it is intersecting, then we need to say uh, maybe, otherwise you can afford to say no. And um, are we good? Okay. Uh, and um, okay, so that's what I wanted to say here. It's a natural, and, and of course at the end of the day, what this boils down to is just looking at the distance between uh, the reconstruction and the query sequence, and if that distance is less than d plus d bar, then we need to say maybe, otherwise we can say no, and this of course is assuming that the distortion criterion satisfies a sort of a triangle inequality. So, to be slightly more concrete about what we can expect this architecture to achieve and how close it might be to the optimum, let's be slightly more concrete about our assumptions. I'll assume that the two sequence, the source and the query sequence are independent, both IID, each with their own distribution, PX, PY, and the distortion uh, and the similarity measure is separable, so it's you know, uh, symbol by symbol distortion. In a few slides, I'll try to say a few words about why this is not as contrived as it is in some other lossy compression problems. Um, but for the time being, just uh, indulge me by accepting these assumptions. And so um, it's pretty easy to write down what this architecture, this natural architecture, is going to achieve. Let me um, spare you, you know, the details, but this is, what the, this is the rate that you can achieve with this, the natural architecture. Rx here is the um, the rate distortion function of the source x evaluated at this distortion. Um, so this I'm actually calling R naive because um, here what I'm doing is I'm using a lossy, comp an opt a rate distortion optimal code. Um, and the R natural is I'm doing essentially the same thing. I'm using the same architecture, but the construction of the code book I'm sort of optimizing to the problem at hand. So still I'm going to do lossy compression, and still it's going to be um, lossy compression with respect to the same distortion criterion with respect to which I'm measuring similarity, but the generation of the code book is optimized for the problem at hand. So that's what I'll call the sort of the rate that you can achieve with this natural architecture. And the question is whether um, or you know, how good is this natural architecture and how does it relate to the best that you can do? So at least in the Gaussian case, 
this natural architecture is, in fact, bless you, is the optimal one. And um, so when x and y are independent and Gaussian and similarity is squared, uh, the square of the difference, then um, the natural architecture is the optimal. And this is the expression that you get simply by sort of substituting into that generic expression from the previous slide the well-known quantities from lossy compression of, of Gaussian sources. And another point maybe to mention is that what you can show is the strong, what I call the strong extremality of the Gaussian distribution for this problem in the sense that not only are the fundamental limits the worst uh, under Gaussianity, but in fact, if you give me the scheme or, or the scheme that we've constructed that achieves this optimal performance, it will do at least as well on, on data, even if it turns out to be non-Gaussian. So it's a very robust scheme. Um, here's what this function looks like. So here's r q of d, and just uh, plotted here in units of sigma squared. And just uh, as a frame of reference, this is the vanilla rate distortion function for the Gaussian source. So perhaps if you look at it for the first time, at least uh, for us, it was slightly striking and initially counterintuitive because we're used to the rate distortion function. Know that here, the first thing you note is that it's actually increasing with d. Okay? So why is it that as d increases, right, as, in a sense, as your notion of similarity is less stringent, sorry, the less stringent your notion of similarity that you're checking for, the more rate you need. And when you think about this picture of deadmissibility, it becomes clear, right? Because the larger d, the larger the similarity ball around the query sequence is. Okay? And so the smaller you need the inverse image of the signature to be for the event of intersection to be of negligible probability. Okay? Um, now, at the extreme points, you see that when, the rate, when the, you know, you're querying for a very small distortion, querying for essentially the question, are the sequences the same? You need very little rate. And that also makes sense, because in that regime, it's enough for me to describe with some reasonable resolution only a very small number of the components of the sequence. And just on the basis of these components, the decoder can compare those to the corresponding components in the query sequence. And already on the basis of that, exclude the possibility of similarity with high probability. And on the other hand, of course, as we approach the sort of typical level of similarity between the two independent sequences, then, of course, there's nothing I can do that will reduce, that will make the probability of a maybe small, because the probability that the sequences are truly similar is non-eligible. So, um, so I hope at least qualitatively you're with me on why this sort of a curve makes sense. Uh, in the binary case, it's a very similar story. So x and y now are fair coin flips. Similarity is measured with Hamming distortion. Uh, again, the naive and natural architecture is optimal. And this is what you get by just substituting into that generic expression, the, the expressions from rate distortion theory. And this is the, um, this is the form of the curve. Again, this is this time dashed for some reason, but this is the vanilla rate distortion curve. Uh, again, qualitatively, same story. Okay? Increasing with d up to the maximal, uh, up to the typ typical level of similarity between two independent sequences. And at zero, it's zero. And in fact, even more than that, this is a sort of uniform source. Here we can show that the derivative of this function is zero. So in other words, and I'll, I'll get back to this point when I show you the few examples, the few uh, experiments we've conducted, this is a good thing. It means that when you're querying for a small level of similarity, or for a high level of similarity, for small distortion, you really need a very, very small rate of the signature. Uh, and in practice, you, of, you often care about these you know, almost exact levels of similarity. So one question you can now ask yourself whether in general um, you know, this sort of an architecture is, is optimal, or do we need to resort to 
larger class of quantization schemes. So you know, this is my attempt to say maybe, maybe balls, but with respect to distortion criteria other than the one that you're using to measure similarity. Or maybe things that can't even construe it as balls at all. Or maybe even discontiguous regions or other crazy forms of quantization. In, in lossy compression, it's pretty clear. It's very easy to show operationally that you never need to resort to quantization cells other than those that correspond essentially to balls corresponding to your distortion criterion. But for this problem, it's a priori not clear at all. So, um, so the answer, well, so I guess this leads us to the question, what is R cube of D? And it's given here, so we need the D bar distance. The D bar distance between two distributions, Px and Py, is the expected distortion. The, the, this is the D that we're using to measure similarity. The expected D between x and y that are uh, in, in infimized or minimized across all joint distributions on x and y that are consistent with this Px and Py. So that's the D bar distance. And the rate distortion function is given as a mutual information between x, your source, and, and u, minimized over all conditionals on u given x, under which the d bar distance between the induced posterior, if you will, on x, on the source x given u, and the distribution of the query sequence py is greater or equal to d. Okay, so that's the rate distortion function. Achievability-wise, um, pretty standard. Basically, what you do is you, you, know, you employ a rate distortion code, and you, um, you let um, u you know, you know, correspond to the reconstruction of the rate distortion code. Uh, the rate that you need is mutual information between x and u. The decoding is going to be uh, the decoder is going to look at the reconstruction sequence, u1 up to un, and it's going to ask itself, okay, who, what, what does this tell me about the, uh, the original data sequence, x? Well, what it will know is that the, um, it'll know the, the conditional type. It'll know the, um, the conditional empirical distribution of the sequence x, given the u sequence that it observes. And then it will ask itself, OK, is there any sequence with this given conditional empirical distribution that I know it needs to have, given the u sequence that I observe, which is within distortion d of the observed sequence y? Okay? Now, if you think about the definition of d bar, that's equivalent to asking whether the d bar distance between the um, conditional empirical distribution on x given u that I know it needs to have and the empirical distribution of the query sequence is that more or less than d. Okay? And this, this expectation is exactly the typical value of this d bar distance that the decoder will be computing. And so what you need is for that typical value to be um, with high probability larger than the similarity criterion that you care about. And that will ensure that typically you'll be um, in position to say no to answer this, this question with a no. I hope that wasn't too uh, <laughs> convoluted. Um, but the, um, the converse part is actually not quite your typical converse. And what it's based on is this gem of a result, which is not as widely known as it should be. It's in a paper by Arsuede et al., which I will be saying more about in, in the next few slides, uh, or in a few slides from now. But this Typical subset lemma is essentially what it tells you is give me any set of sequences, and this could be an arbitrarily wacky set. You can always find a subset of it of essentially the same size, exponentially speaking, which can be construed essentially as a conditional type with respect to some auxiliary u, which, which is not too large in its cardinality. So you can use that um, to really lower bound the performance of any scheme that you give me with arbitrarily crazy quantization cells by a scheme of the type that we've seen in the previous slide in the achievability that has sort of conditional types 
as its quantization cells. And this almost gets you home free. It, show, it, it allows you to show that any rate which is less than this RQ of D in the previous slide will be such that you can't get probability of maybe vanishing exponentially rapidly. And then you need to sprinkle on top a pretty standard application of the blowing up lemma that shows you that if it's less than that RQ of D, then not only will it not vanish exponentially, it will actually not vanish at all. In fact, you get for free that it will, in fact, you get this strong converse, it'll go to one, and in fact, it'll go to one exponentially rapidly. So everything you, you need. Um, okay, so the bottom line is that you don't need to go too far. We understand the architecture, and it's sort of, the quantization cells are sort of similarly as in rate distortion. They are the type of sort of conditional typicality bulbs. Uh, and just in case you're wondering, so in general, uh, yes, the, the, you can do better, strictly better than the natural architecture. Even, you know, this um, sparing you the details, ternary source, Hamming loss. Um, you can find examples where the natural architecture is strictly better than the naive one. And, um, but the optimum is, is when you do quantization under a distortion criterion other than the the one with respect to which we're measuring similarity, uh, or in this case, other than Hamming. So let me quickly say something about error exponents. Um, so many of you know well what error exponents are. Uh, in our setting, it's, right, it corresponds to, well, okay, in practice, the data size is finite. We're gonna have to work with a rate R, which is more than RQ of D, then the minimum rate that you need to get vanishing probability of maybe. We're gonna work at some rate larger than that. We're gonna want them to ask. Uh, and so if you do, the probability of maybe can be made to vanish exponentially rapidly. It'll vanish like two to the minus N something. That's something exactly the error exponent. And so as you can imagine also for finite amounts of data, understanding this object and how to achieve it is as important um, as the understanding of RQ of D. So I won't go into details, but one thing we've been able to do is characterize the, this error exponent explicitly for the Gaussian case. Here I'm plotting it. Um, by the way, Venkat, how much time do I have? Just so I know what level of detail I can afford to. Uh... You're going like it's so much, I guess. Okay. Probably like 15 minutes. Okay, great. So here you can see, um, here I'm plotting this. We have this, the, ex the expression explicitly, I'm just sparing you, but you can see it plotted here. Um, we're taking a distortion level, a similarity level, which, is, uh, which corresponds to a minimum rate that you need for vanishing probability of maybe of two bits per symbol. So any rate that you work above that will give you a positive exponent. Um, and here it is going up until, well, the point, uh, the, the exponential decay rate of the probability that the two sequences really are similar. And um, actually, this, the points on, these, these, um, on this curve are actually also achieved by essentially this natural architecture, almost. You need to spend a few a negligible number of bits to just describe where on the radius of the sphere on which the source sequence lies, and then you essentially do this natural architecture on the sphere. Um, here's an error exponent for discrete case, finite alphabet case when the distortion is zero. So you're querying for exact matches. So let's see what, what we can expect to see here. When the distortion is small, when, it, when it's, when we know that, you know, when we saw that RQ of D for D small is, is small, when RQ of D for D zero is zero, so we expect to see a positive exponent at positive R, but not only is it positive, right off the bat, it starts out at something positive, and um, there's something, well, okay, pop quiz, so X is IID PX, Y IID PY, and they're independent, what is the probability that they have the same type? They have the same empirical distribution. 
So if they come from different distributions, px and py, this probability, we expect it to be exponentially small. Right? But what is the exponent? So we were kind of surprised um, to find that the answer is twice the Bhattacharya distance. Here's a Bhattacharya distance. So for us, so it's the first time we realized that this Bhattacharya distance, which is a cute measure of distance between distributions, actually has this nice operational interpretation. And by the way, this is a nice uh, exercise, a few lines worth of an exercise. Next time you teach information theory, uh, you can give it. And then, um, and then you have this linear increase of slope one of the exponent, which essentially you're getting by binning. The, oh, by the way, how, how do we achieve this? Well, all you need to do is to describe to the decoder the type of a source sequence, of, of a source sequence right? And then the decoder, all it needs is to say, okay, is the, is the type equal to the type of the query sequence that I'm seeing? And only then I need to say maybe. Okay? So that's how you achieve this point. And here you have this linear increase of slope one uh, by binning, which is our way of saying random hash functions. And then this gets you up to the point uh, of this point, which is, again, the exponential rate of the decay, uh, the probability that the sequences are truly equal, which is this quantity, so-called the collision entropy. OK. Um, and we will soon be submitting a paper that actually gives you this error exponent quite explicitly for any, any discrete source uh, at any distortion or similarity level. But this was perhaps a point, you know, talking about uh, error exponents, to give due mention to this paper of uh, Alsuede et al. And you really got to hand it to Alsuede for having been ahead of his time in the formulation and, and of, of many significant problems. Some got the instant recognition that they deserved, but others, like this one, uh, apparently did not. So just before the talk, I checked and found that uh, it has 17 citations, I think t 10 of which are by us from the last year, and another <laughs> seven probably self-citations. Uh, but basically what they did in terms of their problem formulation, it really includes, in fact, subsumes much of what I just talked about. Uh, so at first we were stressed out, uh, but the truth is when you look closely at the, the answers that they gave, the solutions that they gave, by the way, we discovered this at a slightly progressed stage of, of our work, but, um, but we were kind of happy to see that they left much still to do. Without going into the detail, uh, I would, and without getting too philosophical, I would say that the difference is that the answers that they give are sort of not what we would consider single letter expressions, what we'd like to call in Shannon theory. They, they consider finite alphabet settings, and yet the answers that they give are sort of you know, limits of optimization problems that involve variables of cardinalities that are increasing without bound. And so that leaves something to be desired uh, in, in Shannon theory. And so that's where, where we came in with, with the characterizations that you've seen here. Um, let me say a word about relevance in, in defense of our, some of our modeling assumptions. So one is, you know, this whole regime of positive rate. So positive rate means like, you know, a linear number, the size of this, the size of the signature is linear in your data. And, you know, if you talk with your CS colleagues, usually if you want to interest them, you really need to talk about orders of magnitude reduction. But on the other hand, as you've seen, uh, this RQ of D, right, it has the, even for, for very interesting sources, discrete sources, and we'll see a few examples in, in the next slide. Uh, they have this, the, not only is it zero at zero, as we've seen, but in fact it's also the derivative is either zero or very small. So if you want to query either exact similarity or, uh, you know, a very high level of similarity, you really can get um, very, very small, you really need very, very small rates. So you could easily get to a rate which is less than 0.01, okay? meaning, you know, one bit for every hundred source symbols uh, in, in typical sort of data. So that 
might be something that your CS friends could start to appreciate. Uh, with respect to the IIDness and separability of distortion for the kind of, for the sequence lengths that we've worked with, uh, DNA data, for example, genomic data, nucleotides, uh, this is a pretty reasonable assumption, the IIDness, and even the separability of distortion for these sequence lengths that we looked at the, um, the most significant sort of event of discrepancy is one that has to do with substitutions, not insertions and deletions. So, for example, Hamming loss is a really reasonable measure of, of similarity. And finally, this assumption that the sequences, the, two, the source and the query sequence are independent. At first, you look at it and say, okay, this is not, this is not natural. I mean, how could two sequences suspected of similarity be independent? But when you think about it some more, this is uh, actually a pretty good and natural model because the event of similarity is the atypical one, right? The event of dissimilarity is the typical one. Now, conditioned on dissimilarity, right, because it's a typical event, that does essentially nothing to the, the probability. So conditioned on dissimilarity, the sequences are, as in the unconditioned case, independent. Okay? And on the other hand, conditioned on similarity, well, of course, additional the sequences being similar, they, are, they will be very dependent. Okay? So that's exactly really what you want, right? Conditioned on dissimilarity, the sequences being independent, and otherwise, they're very dependent. So, um, okay. So with this, let me, so after hopefully I convinced you that um, these models and assumptions are not that contrived. Oh, and by the way, another thing I'll mention in this setting is uh, the, the IIDness and separability of distortion. Uh, I won't go into detail, but we're actually talking now with people from Yahoo who are giving us data to work on. Uh, that, and, and what you end up doing in many cases, and we've seen this actually in the talk by Ben, that you work in the feature domain. And, in the, and even though your data may not be IID and the distortion and the similarity and distortion in the original domain will, might not be uh, naturally separable, if you do your feature extraction right, then the feature domain, the assumption of IIDness and separability of distortion, let's say using L2 or L1 as a distortion criterion, is very, is very natural. So here are two toy examples. That we, um, that we looked at, uh, we actually have some more in the making, but didn't make it to this talk. This we presented in Allerton. Uh, basically what we did was just in, in, implement this natural architecture that we've seen. In fact, the naive architecture for these two sources that you'll see is the optimal one. So basically just off the shelf lossy compressors, slightly tweaked, but I, I won't go into it. And so here's one thing. We did, for fair coin flips, uh, Hamming similarity, sequences of length 512. You can compute, uh, and we're querying for similarity level 0.05, so 5% similarity. You can show, you can compute the RQ of D, so this, this here is RQ of D, that's the minimum rate of the signature that you need to get a small probability of maybe. But of course here the data is finite and is fixed. So what's interesting is to look at this plane of rate versus probability of maybe. So here are the few points that we got. Um, and here in green is a lower bound. I won't go into the details, but it's what you would achieve if you used it by assuming that the lossy compression part is rate distortion optimal, that you're achieving a point on the rate distortion curve. And another thing we tried to do, um, and it wasn't easy to find a sort of a not completely apple to oranges comparison. So one thing we were able to do is compare this to what you would have achieved with LSH, uh, local sensitivity hashing. Some of you are familiar with that. So we took this one point uh, that corresponds to a rate 0.07, we saw what we're getting, the probability of maybe is something, and mind you, in our case, the probability of misdetection is zero. LSH has some parameter you can play with that trades off the probability of maybe or the probability of misdetection. Without going into the details, when you sort of calibrate it to be at the same rate, uh, 
you get that the probability of maybe is larger than ours, uh, and while at the same time also having positive probability of misdetection. So that's essentially the only scheme that we were able to come up with where we could somehow do a um, apples to apples comparison. The second experiment we did was on real DNA data. So we, we went to this, okay. okay. So we went to this um, biozone database and we took many, many sequences of length 100, queried for similarity level 0.1, 10%. What you're seeing here in red are the points that we got in this rate probability of maybe uh, plane. And in blue, what you're seeing is the points we would have achieved if the data were IID with a distribution which is equal to the empirical distribution of the data, uh, which is very close to a uniform distribution. So it's actually uh, reassuring to see, in terms of our modeling assumptions, it's, it's reassuring to see how close these curves, these two curves are. Um, and then, you know, here you see RQ of D and the lower bound according to, in, assuming the IID source. Um, by the way, for the, bl for the blue curve, the real data, uh, the point, the probability of maybe is a true, it's an empirical probability of maybe average with respect to all the sequences uh, on the database. Yes? What is n equal to length of the range of the sequence? Yes, yes, the length of the sequences. So the DNA is much longer than that, right? So right, right. So, so what we're doing is, you know, extract for every segment of 100, extracting, you know, a signature. And then uh, at this point, I mean, I'm not yet saying that this is going to be something that you're going to implement. That's not going to be the basis for the biozone uh, system. But it's a start. So here we're looking at this uh, relatively, um, you know, this is the first step. We're looking at, we're just extracting sequences of length 100, and, and now we're, in a sense, constructing a somewhat artificial database, but not totally artificial with, you know, simulated data, but constructed with real DNA sequences or segments of DNA sequences of length 100. Okay. Um, but I agree, this is just a, you know, a first step toward um, employing this on, on the real biological databases. So maybe quickly to say a few words on, okay, I don't have time to say anything on related info theory literature is essentially only the paper as far as we're aware of, of a Suede et al, closely related, and there's all sorts of stuff that many of you know well from the CS community, depending on the sub-community come from, going by names of hashing, bloom filters, sketching, distance preserving dimensionality reduction and so on. Um, so we definitely plan to, and there's room for sort of bridging the gap and understanding and, you know, in terms of trying to do more apple to apple comparisons. Uh, roughly, I would say that in the CS literature, the emphasis is more on, on algorithms and on complexity uh, than on the theory and, and the analysis. Uh, also, there are some sort of technical differences. They, they Usually they don't need and they don't require zero probability of misdetection. Um, but there is room for sort of understanding and, you know, um, trying to put all these schemes together on the same footing. Also, uh, another maybe significant point of difference is that they don't really care. We care, our only criterion is storage space, right, the size of the signature. And that's sometimes a proxy for complexity, but not necessarily. Um, and these guys, what they really care about is how to quickly and efficiently uh, extract signatures. And it's not about necessarily their size, but about how quickly you can extract them. So there's some room for trying to uh, put everything on the same footing. I'm going to spare you a recap. I'm assuming you were with me. I'll spare you future directions on the information theory because you're as good as I am in trying to think about other extensions and variations that would be natural here to pursue. Uh, but maybe I'll just quickly, don't worry, this is my last slide, take a step back uh, and try to think about the bigger picture. If you think about our initial motivation, right? We had this, uh, what we're, we're trying to do is extract signatures we have this big database, and we're trying to extract signatures from 
different pieces of data in it to come up with this much more modest compressed database. And this compressed database, it also has this property that you know, not only is it much smaller than the original big database, but it also has a property that if you care about one, about querying one sequence in the original big database, you really only need to look at a signature and you, in a sense decompress or just look at the signature associated with that, um, with that original data. Okay, so you have this um, property Assuming that you know the keys, then they're all that we, we used uh, fixed fixed length keys. Then it's very easy to to just you know immediately access the relevant signature if you want to infer something about the corresponding sequence in the database, and that's an important property. Um, and you know I think in the CS community, by necessity, many have have looked at and, and you know there are whole fields about you know, random access and direct access for, for databases and so on. But I think um, in terms of things coming out of information theory, uh, if you look at, you know, the successes in practice, like of, of GZIP, for example, uh, it's uh, largely based on Lempel-Ziv. These are schemes that were sort of optimized for global properties, like the overall compression rate, the overall size of the data. They don't have these, this sort of local decodability, this sort of random access property. If you want to recover one symbol in the original file, you really need to gzip, to, to decompress the whole gzip file. Um, so I think there's room also for people like us in information theory to try and formulate problems that will somehow try to, you know, formally quantify maybe trade-offs between, you know, how much say you need to back off from entropy and how sort of locally decodable you are. I think once we try to formulate these questions, we'll be able to come up with nice theory and then even, God forbid, uh, come up with interesting schemes that other people will, will care about. So thank you. Right, right. So, so the truth is, again, that even now as we discuss, we had some conversations with some practitioners from Yahoo, we're realizing that, um, and as I mentioned here, what they really care about is, is complexity issues. It's how to, and, and for, for us often, you know, the storage size, which is what we care about, like minimizing rate and so on, to an extent it's sometimes a good proxy for complexity. But in other cases, and usually I think the bottom line today when people try to query big data and so on, it's about how to effectively and quickly extract signatures that you will sort of computationally effectively be able to answer all sorts of questions. Um, so I think that, so currently I don't see any problem where these schemes or the schemes that are coming out of this point formulation will be, you know, just you can apply them exactly and they're going to solve your problems. Uh, but again, my hope is that, you know, if you use maybe some of what we've done here as a building block, and as I said, in the construction, say, of a compressed database, it could lead to some interesting schemes that have, um, you know, competitive trade-offs in terms of things like the local decodability and the compression rate and maybe even complexity. Uh, but I think there's, as I said, this is largely ongoing. I think there is much more room for um, better understanding of how you can sort of put all these different frameworks on the same frame of reference. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Following up on this question, in the specific application of the biosome. What separates your scheme from being actually applicable and usable for now? Right, so a few things. So one is as David alluded, currently our 
our framework is for, you know, for fixed, for sequences of fixed length, um, where they're the sequences of variable length. Um, but another is, as I, as I also told um, Andrea, it's, more, it's not only about um, storage space. It's about efficient, efficient extraction of these signatures and efficient, computationally efficient ways of, of answering all sorts of um, queries. There's also um, the, the issue that when things become larger, you know, uh, sequence lengths that are instead of hundreds, like thousands and tens of thousands, as, as is the case with just genomic data, then distortion criteria or similarity criteria other than symbol by symbol, in particular those that take into account insertions and deletions and so on, they are much more relevant. And for those, both our theory currently, uh, I mean, leaves much to be, and there's a lot of theoretical understanding, which is still waiting to be gained. Uh, and also, again, back to the computational point, then even things like computing the distortion between, you know, the similarity between two sequences, even that from a computational viewpoint is, is challenging. So, um, so again, I think there's, so there's it's some... More, it's more about just where your assumptions fail, it's more distortion method than the memoryless assumptions. I, I believe... <laughs> I believe so, although not exactly, because at these large time scales, it goes together because, you know, if you have, okay, even if your source is memoryless, but then, you know, once you think about, you corrupt that, let's say, to get another, to another, even if your original sequence was memoryless, the next sequence, you know, given this one, is no longer memoryless if there's a mechanism of insertions and deletions. So a lot of things uh, break down and, and deserve further thought on these various levels, theoretical and, and computational. Do you think all this fast uh, kernel code is, uh, I don't know, is helpful for you? Um, so yes, I think, um, so again, to the extent that you buy our framework and that any of this is relevant to a real problem, I think we can use a lot of the know-how from, from communication and from velocity compression to make these schemes pretty, you know, computationally realistic to implement. Um, so my short answer is yes. In fact, the points, the, the two examples that I've shown you and the points that we got, we've used, um, you know, practical implementations of lossy compressors. So. Thank you. Thank you.